Good morning. Hope you had a great weekend. Here we are on uh, Monday, June 8th, and uh, we're back into the Word. And uh, may God give us our daily bread according to Matthew 6, 11. And that's why we call this the 6, 11 Bible study. Uh, again, just to reiterate, it's our goal is to not just bring some things from the Word uh, that might be applicable to our present day, might have a devotional concept to it, but one of the goals and is to to try to help us to to get into that habit of study, that habit of study, how to study, what to study, what are some tools that we use, um, what would benefit the study, how long do I study? Uh, these are all things that I hope that will be an encouragement to you. Uh, I, obviously, we started this as a as a means to help get the word out during uh, the lockdowns that have taken place due to COVID-19. But um, I've also uh, feel like and have seen that we, you know, there's been a good response and we can continue in a lot of these areas. And if it could benefit you, great. That's wonderful. Um, we do live in a day and age where there is a, a real weakness of the understanding of the Word of God. And I know that sounds... You know, I don't want to sound arrogant on that. I don't want to sound like I've got it all figured out. I have a lot still to learn. Um, but as I even preached a bit yesterday, um, you know, where some of our pastors are on some things uh, is alarming to me. Uh, Wishy-washy. They, they, they go this way. They go that way. They do what's right in their own eyes. They, they don't have a good fundamentals of the Scripture. So that's a that's a problem for God. God will take care of that with that those. But as a as a pastor of a church, uh, we want to be like the church in Berea. We want to we want to study and look into those. They were they were a more noble people because they studied the Word of God, and that's what our goal is. And so good to see you coming on board this morning. I was reminded I didn't tell you the story of the dogs. So I have two dogs. I have. Um, we have Farley, who's about 11, going on 12, getting older. And he was get, he's getting really lethargic. I mean, he's really old acting, you know, and uh, just lays around all day, doesn't want to eat, has some trouble relieving himself. And then I got this puppy in part to see if it would revise him, you know, revi revitalize him, to get him up and moving and doing things. Well, all he does is just look at him, go back to bed, right? So I have Baron, who's a, a German shepherd. Uh, very active, very bright, very smart. And when I got him, I got him uh, from a, a breeder here in Vermont, and and she uses a particular type of diet, which deals more in, in the area of raw and organic. So I continued him in that diet, and I began to read up more and more about diet. So <clears throat> I decided after some study that maybe I need to change the, the old dog's diet, you know, and um, because he just wouldn't, he wouldn't hardly eat it. It was kibble. And so I started giving him the very same stuff that I was giving uh, Baron. Do you know what's happened to Farley? All of a sudden, he's devouring his food. He's a little bit more active. And he he's, seems to be doing better. So I'm going to keep watching it. But what was, the, what was the, the, the thing I was talking about last week? I was talking about the dobbing. Remember, I was talking about the untempered mortar. Sometimes we just do things just to be doing it, and we think that's going to fix and that's going to work. Uh, sometimes things don't work as we think. We need to do a little bit more into it. And uh, so I was using that illustration between Baron and Farley to show that what we, we eat on really does have a, an effect, and that happens to us physically. That happens to us mentally, emotionally, and it definitely happens to us spiritually. So let's get into the Word, and let's eat on the bread of life. Uh, the Word of God. We're doing a study today on Jonah. Jonah, we, our goal today, Jonah is a four chapters, very short book. I mean, it is one of the shortest ones, but it's very profound. It centralizes mostly on the prophet Jonah and his workings to the city of Nineveh. Okay, and um, we're going to talk about some of those details behind that, again, setting the introduction today and going forward. So with that, let's do this. So, we're dealing with Jonah, all right? Somewhere around 650 B.C. Now, because we just finished Jeremiah, um, <clears throat> he comes about 150 plus years before Jeremiah. So, this is pre, 
captivity. Okay, now <clears throat> this is one of the problems when you're looking at the the Bible. The Bible isn't always laid out chronological. Okay, so when we're reading, we see Jeremiah in the almost just to the right of center of the Old Testament, and then we see Jonah all the way at the other end. We think, well, Jonah must have come after Jeremiah. No, Jonah comes before Jeremiah. In fact, Jonah comes right after Elisha, and he's contemporaries with other minor prophets like Hosea and Amos. The king of the time is Jeroboam the second. Jeroboam the second. Jeroboam the first is the one that created the divisions between the north and the southern kingdoms. Uh, he he was the counterpart to Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And that's Jeremiah the first, and Jeremiah the set or Jeroboam the second. I'm sorry, Jeroboam the second comes along uh, much later after Elisha, uh, under uh, a, a dominating near a dominating country like Assyria, and that's where Nineveh is. Okay, uh, Nineveh is considered a really brutal, brutal, horrendous people. Um, they they do some real uh, scary stuff. And we've seen some scary stuff come out of the Middle East too, haven't we? Uh, about this, this, some thinking that goes on the way, the way they treat the enemy. And that's kind of the, the mindset that's there today. And it was there during the time of Jonah. And this is why Jonah doesn't want to go there. So in, <clears throat> in a present day vernacular, uh, if we could use this illustration, it's like God calling a man to go to Arabia, go to uh, Iraq, and be a missionary, right? That's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about going somewhere where it's, you're dealing with the people that are brutal. Uh, you're dealing with regimes that are uh, anti-God, tremendously anti-God, and they will throw you in prison at a blink of an eye, right? And now that's our perception of what goes on, but we see a lot of it. And uh, we kind of can relate to that. So that's what's going on here as we get into the book of Jonah. Again, you can use tools similar to this one, Talk Through the Bible uh, by Wilkinson and Boa. Uh, it gives us some information that helps us to, to kind of set the stage for, for Jonah. And then, of course, we're going to use the Word of God. We're going to use the Word of God. If you're looking at some... Uh, some things here to to build on. Um, let's let's talk about how we can make application. I think the Word of God is applicable to every generation at any moment of time, don't you? And so we want to make application here, all right? And so I wrote down a few things uh, to get started with. How does this book apply to me? How does that book apply to where we are today? And um, and so I, I jotted some things down. Maybe you could too and share those with us this week and then I could share those later. So here we go. Uh, first things we gather from this story is God's power. God's power over nature. We're going to read about a storm. We're going to read about seas. We're going to read about a big fish. All right. We're going to read how God calls a man uh, to, to do something or a woman to do something. And then... We're in this area today that we call Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, and Jonah's really wrestling with, Jonah's really wrestling with the lives of Nineveh. God wants to bring judgment he, because they are so wicked, but he's going to give them a chance to hear the truth of God and repent. Nineveh is, is a wicked city. It's as wicked as they come, and yet Jonah, and Jonah doesn't want to go there. He, does, he, he In fact, we're going to read in just a second he, the very reason he didn't want to go there because he knew God would have mercy on them. And that's, 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 a, that's the irony of, of this is that there are, there are servants of God who don't want to do God's work because they know God will have mercy or use them in that person's life to, to repent. And they don't want them to repent. Isn't that sad? But that's true. And we're going to examine that a little bit as we move along. So another thing that we learn here from... From this story is God is long suffering and he is merciful. Okay? He's long suffering and merciful in disobedience. Who is the disobedient one? Jonah. And he's long suffering and merciful in the saving of the wicked. Okay? 
And so we see that as well. Now, Jonah is one of four prophets mentioned by Jesus. Let's look at what Jesus said regarding Jonah. This again from another tool of ours out of Matthew chapter number 12. Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas, or as we say, Jonah. Jonas is the Greek of the word Jonah. And for, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And notice this phrase right here. Right there. The men of Jonah, or the men of Nineveh, shall rise in judgment with this generation. So the saved of the, of the generation of Nineveh will judge the generation that is presently of the Pharisees and the Jews of this day and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Whoa. As wicked as Nineveh was, they repented. And God says they're going to stand in judgment to the very people he's talking to because he knows they're not going to repent. Mm. But God is merciful and God is long-suffering. Let's look at a couple key verses out of Jeremiah or Jonah. I'm probably going to keep doing that because we were in Jeremiah and then I have to start thinking. So one of the places we want to go here is Jonah chapter number 2, verse number 8. They that observe lying vanities, and this is tied a lot to idolatry, forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee, but I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Okay, so we see those that are going to trust in lying vanities are not going to be saved. But those that will trust in the Lord will be saved. Let's look at another verse here, and we'll get started. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 2, or Matthew, Jonah chapter number 4, verse 2. He said, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness and repentance thee of evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah's got a heart problem. He just, he cannot even be happy when Nineveh repents. He can't even be happy that God used him to help Nineveh to repent. And so we see this contrast from the, the beginning to the end. Notice the very first verses. Chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. Notice it says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But then notice the very end, the last verse. In Chapter 4, verse 11. And should not I spare Nineveh, the great city wherein thou, uh, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? Even at the end, we see Jer Jonah is not happy about what has taken place. He, he rejected at the end. He rejects the results at the end, or at the beginning of the end. And I want you to note that phrase. He said, God says, shouldn't I be gracious to people that don't even know the right hand from the left? We can get really angry with what we see today in the news. There's a lot of ignorance going on. Maybe we should use the phraseology of God. They don't know the right hand from their left. But we still have to have mercy. We still need to be long-suffering with as God. Let's go with God. Let's do his bidding. And today, as you go forth... Let's all be aware that there are a lot of Ninevites among us that need to know Christ. Go with God. He's worth it. 
Let God go with you. It will be a blessing. See ya.